thought I had some seconds left. How's everybody doing today? Nah, I'm going to try that again. I don't care if you're going to wave your hand, but you got to do something. How's everybody doing today? Swell. Oh, yeah. Got some life in this room. Man, they told me where the spirit of the Lord is. I heard that we were free to give him praise and glory for him being who he is. Is he a good God? Oh. You know, I was talking to Father uh, um, a few moments ago. He didn't promise us a flower field with no problems and lilies and, you know, everything just being just as peachy and pretty. But one thing he did tell us is that when things are not going the way you think they should go, I'll be there. When things are ugly, when things are great, guess what? I'll be there. And that's the promise that we have. The promise is, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will always be there with you. Now, that's a promise. My mama didn't promise me that. She's gone. And I miss her. But there's one thing for sure I can say. Jesus Christ is right here. He's right here with me. And I love that. How about you? Amen. Beautiful.
there's something about us coming together, lifting our voices together, singing songs Holy God. to Jesus to let him know that we appreciate him. Things are a little different this morning. We don't have our drummer. That space is a little empty. But I got a maestro over there on that keyboard that's going to keep us going with his machine. So we appreciate the technology and giving the maestro a chance to get his stuff together. Everybody doing great this morning? Yeah. Man, that Jesus Christ has been busy this week. He's been helping. I, I needed the help this week. And when I tell you he was on time, he was just right. You know, there are some times when you can't feel him. You know, I, I almost feel like tapping my hip and said, power on. Come on, Jesus. Power on. Come on, let me see you. Let me see you do what you do. But those are the times that he teaches me faith. I'm here. And I'm going to be there for you, whatever you're dealing with. I got you. I hate to say this, but I, was, uh, I had to go to court one time, and, and they told me that I needed a lawyer. So I said, man, I got Jesus. Man, I ain't paying about no lawyer. I ain't paying for no lawyer. I got that room. Boy, I was looking for Jesus. Because I was being beat up inside that room. But when I went and got what I was supposed to get, I won the battle. So I had to do it the right way. So I would tell you, if you don't have Jesus Christ, you're doing it the wrong way. Because God is able to do so much more than what we can ever ask for. Don't leave here today without us. You ready? Maestro ready. your song. I know you know it. Do that part again. 
God is awesome. Can I get a witness in the house? Can you just can you just give him a hand clap and let him know we appreciate him for being the awesome God that he is? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Isn't God awesome? I bless his name. He's worthy. Just to even talk about how awesome he is. This weekend, like you said, God has done some stuff for you. Friday, I went to the store with my daughter and my two little grandkids. And I didn't take my purse in, but I had my little change purse. Well, in my change purse is a couple of dollars, you know, and my credit cards. As I was getting in the car, my phone was ringing. I'm trying to do everything. I dropped it. I didn't know I had dropped it till I got home. <laughs> well, I live in Las Lunas. The store is at least 25 minutes away. And I said, oh, Lord, I don't want to lose my credit cards. I didn't care about the money. They can keep the money. But who would turn back? Who would turn in all that anyway? But I thought about it, and I sent my daughter. She said, well, I'll go look, Mom. And I called the store, and I said, I know I'm asking something that sounds impossible, but did you by any chance find a little coin purse that's square, it's red, I can tell you the name in it? And she said, well, let me look. She said, ma'am, you ain't gonna believe this. But it was there. <laughs> Somebody had turned it in. See, God will take care of you when you do what you're supposed to do even when you don't do what you're supposed to do. Because God is a good God like that. He will take care of you, you know, so you be faithful. Even during this time right now, it seems like things is really rough and hard, but God has still been faithful. I ain't lacked on nothing. I have not lacked. As a matter of fact, I didn't gain a lot of weight because we eating a lot. We cooking at home. We cooking that heavy stuff. You know, that fried food, that that baked stuff, you know, stuff we don't need to even be eating, but we eat, but we rest. Our bodies have recuperated from all the damage we've been doing to it all this other time, ripping and running up and down the highway. But God is faithful, and I just thank him. Reading to you from Psalms 148, it says, Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise ye him, all you angels. Praise ye him, all hosts. Praise ye him, sun and moon. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Let them that praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He has also established them forever and ever. He has made a decree which shall not pass. Praise the Lord from the earth, ye dragons, and all ye deeps, fire and hail, snow and, and vapors, stormy winds fulfilling his words, mountains and all hills, fruitful trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowls, kings of the earth and all people, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and old maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord for his name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. He also exalted the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, even the children of Israel, ye people near unto him. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! God, we thank you. Lord, we give your name glory and honor for you are an awesome and a mighty God. You have all power and all authority in your hand. And we ask, oh God, that you would meet us here in this place. You said where two or three are gathered in your name, that there you would be in the midst. And we welcome you even on this morning. We bind anything that is not like you. Satan, we call you right now out. Get out this place. Set the people free. Those that are heavy laden and burdened down, release them right now in the name of Jesus. Have your way, God. Bless the man of God today as he speaks. Oh, God, under your authority. 
mighty under your anointing. Let your power fall in this place in the name of Jesus.
any other father will do, we're going to release the man of God in this place. Bring us the word that God has given him. Come on, put your hands together. For the Honorable Reverend Damon Shelby. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Truly, we count it an honor and privilege to be here this morning. Can I get some more volume, please? We count it an honor and privilege to be here this morning. As we've come, would everybody rest upon your feet this morning? Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray right now, God, that you would touch each and every one of us that's here. Father, this word that you've given unto us, help us to rightly divide it and dispense and disseminate it to these, your people. Now, Father, touch us right now from the crown of our head to the sole of our feet. Allow us to speak, to minister your word to these, your people. Let my flesh be silent so that they can hear from thee and not me. In the precious and mighty name of Jesus, we pray, amen and amen. While you're standing, grab your Bibles this morning. I know you can't high-five somebody. Just look to your neighbor and give them a high-five and tell them, I'm glad you're here to help me magnify the God of my salvation. Oh, y'all sound like y'all don't come to have no church this morning. Y'all might as well just stay at home. Why get up, get dressed, come to the house of God to sit like a bump on the log? You could do that at home in your bed, but when you come to the house of the Lord, you got to have a praise deep down on the inside. You got to come to give you some glory, some honor, and some praise. I want you to open your Bibles to the book of St. Luke, chapter number two. It's here we're going to, the Lord has given us a word. This morning I want to give a shout out to somebody who's here, a young man that grew up in this church who is a few months away from being a doctor of chiropractic medicine. Dr. Todd County is in the house this morning. Can we give God a hand praise? This young man is down in, I believe it's, is it Carter Chiropractic School in, in Dallas? He's down there. He started with a big group of individuals. This program is nothing slacking. Nothing that you can lack on. He has been seeing people weeded out. But God has blessed him to stay amongst the number. He's on his way to graduation, and we're so glad about it. So if you go in a few days, some of you old folk may need your necks, your backs, your legs cracked. Dr. County would be the one that you can come and see. But we just thank God for him and all of you that are here this morning. But here in the book of St. Luke chapter number 2. Commencing at verse number 41, the word of the Lord reads, Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. And when they had fulfilled the days, as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem. And Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to be, have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. And it came to pass that after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. You may be seated. This morning I want to speak from the subject, don't lose sight of Jesus. Don't lose sight 
of Jesus. We have all in here that, and you that are viewing this morning, sometimes I think we take for granted the senses that God has given unto us. As I was thinking about it and laboring in my mind, I began to question if God came to each and every one of us out of the five senses that we have, being able to taste, to touch, to smell, to hear, and to see, those of us who have those in operations right now, what sense would you be willing to let go of? I began to think about it. And for me, I don't know about you, I'd rather leave the, this one, all other ones alone, except being able to see. When you begin to think about sight, have you ever just got up sometime in the midst of the daytime and just closed your eyes and just begin to try to walk? We have a memory in our mind of the places maybe we may be in our house, on the office, even down here at the church. But when your eyes are closed and darkness is upon you and you're trying to navigate your way, you can't see. I'd rather be able to see than to be able to hear, than be able to taste, to touch, because it's something about sight. But you know, some of us right now, we got sight and we're still blind because we done lost sight of really what's really important. Sometimes we get caught up in the things around us more than what God has focused us to be looking at. Have you ever thought about it? The pandemic that we're in right now. Some folk were so focused on going to work, making money, which ain't nothing wrong with that. Everybody wants to make some money. But did you, in the process, many folk lost sight of the significance of what they really were up to. God intended for us to stay focused on the prize, which is the high calling in Christ Jesus. But many of us got caught up in that fabulous home we got. Many of us got caught up in the car we drive, in the clothes we got. Instead of focusing on that, all that stuff is insignificant because that's not where my sight, my focus should be. My sight and focus should not be on the natural, materialistic things, but the spiritual things that have the real weight and significance for my living. Because when I depart this life, all the money I got in my pocket, $2.75, I can't take it with me. The clothes I got on my back, I can't take it with me. Because when I leave here, the only thing that matters is, is my soul correct and right with the word of the Lord. But see, what we got to do is sometimes we can't get so focused on everything around us. You begin to think about it. We as men, our job, our role in the household. Sometimes we get so fixated on making the most money we can make, on providing what we can provide for our households, that we sometimes lose sight of our relationship with the Father. This is where we got to change some things in this day and time where we're in. This pandemic has been sent as we've stated and we're going to continue to state. This has been sent for us as believers to get our eyes on the prize, which is Jesus Christ. Some of you got so caught up in the things around you, you forgot the creator and fell in love with the creation. Some of you got so caught up in everything you got you fail to recognize and realize that it's Jesus who gave it to me. He's the one I get to give the worship and praise to. Not my employer, not my bank account, but Jesus Christ, who's the lover of my soul. Here we see something powerful in this text. The Bible lets us see something here. That here in verse number 41, it said, Every year, his parents, Mary and Joseph, would go to the feast of the Passover. If you know anything about the Jewish people, the three main feasts that they partake of each and every year, and those that are able usually try to make that pilgrimage over to Jerusalem. I read somewhere where those who live within 15 miles, those men, they are required, 15 miles of Jerusalem, are required each and every year to attend these feasts. The Passover, the feast that commemorates the awesome day when they were the exodus, the release from the bondage and oppression of being in slavery for over 400 years in Egypt. 
This is a feast that they partake of. The other feast that's important is the Passover, that besides the Passover is Pentecost, or the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Feast of the pa uh, Unleavened Bread and the Pentecost was a great time, a great moment, because in the Old Testament, it represented the giving of the law on Mount Sinai. But in the New Testament, it, it commemorates something very powerful. For the Bible lets us know that on the day of Pentecost, they were in the upper room, the 120, in one place, in one accord. And as they were sitting, something powerful, a rushing mighty wind came in from heaven. And it filled everyone was there. And they began to speak in tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. They were all filled. A great day was the Pentecost. And then you had the feast, the last one they called the Feast of Tabernacles of Booths. This was the feast where they celebrated in Jerusalem there. They would get tents. They would get booths because this was the feast that they celebrated being in the wilderness, wandering the 40 years that they were there. But out of these feasts, Passover was the greatest one. It has historically and religiously, it was the most important of the feast for the Jewish people. And here the Bible lets us see that now the family of Joseph and Mary, they go up here to the Passover. Here they are, they're celebrating. It was an event. The Passover was just one day. But it was combined with the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was seven days. So this eight-day celebration, it was like a convention, if you will. Those of you who remember the days of convention, that's a day and a time that's somewhat gone past from us. We've gotten so far advanced in our technology and in our doings and thinkings of way of doing things that the convention setting is not like it used to be because of social media now. You don't have to go to a convention uh, in person. You can... Get on your phone, get on your tablet, get on your computer, and the convention is right there in your living room, your bedroom, wherever you want it to be. But I thought about how when I was a child, we used to go to the PAW conventions. We would be there for the young people's body because the other parts of the convention, they, we called them the old folks' convention. But I remember when I had to work, when I started working for the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World, and I had to go to the convention not one week, three days, four days, but for 14 days I was there at the convention. And I remember being able to see the mothers come in and the missionary movement would happen. I was there when the general body took place. I was there for foreign missions. And then at the end to kick it off and send it out the young people. But by the time the young people got there, I was tired and ready to go home. And even though I was a young man. But here Joseph and Mary, they're having a great time. They're here. These people did not go. The family just did not go by themselves, but they kind of went as a community. They did a caravan. They would go. The women and the children and the men would all go up to uh, Jerusalem, and there they were ready to celebrate and commemorate the great feast of God, what he had done for them and brought them through. And this was their way of giving back and letting the Lord know we thank you and we bless you. I'm so grateful that I don't have to wait for a feast to come about, but each and every day my feet touch the ground. I can have Pentecost. I can have Passover. And I can have the Feast of the Tabernacles. But here they are. Jesus now, the Bible lets us know, we see something here. This is the first time we see something about Jesus mentioned as far as ministry go. Twelve years of age, he now goes to Jerusalem. Here he is in celebration for the Passover. This is significant because the next year following this event, Jesus turns 13. And in the Jewish tradition, when a Jewish male becomes 13 years of age, he is now called one of the sons of commandment. He is now ready for what they call their bar mitzvah, which is in Jewish tradition and law. This young man at 13 is now religiously and morally responsible for his own well-being. He has now become a full-fledged member of the Jewish community. So Jesus was getting a taste and a foreshadowing of what he was about to fully get into. Can you think of and imagine at 13 years of age, you're now responsible for your own spiritual salvation. You're now responsible for upholding the 613 laws of the Torah, which no man can. But you're 13 years of age. And for a young lady, it's 12 years of age that you're now able and responsible. And you're a full-fledged member of the community. You have a bat mitzvah. Big, beautiful celebrations that they have. But here Jesus now gets a taste at 12 years of age. The Bible lets us see now that they're there. Jesus is part of the celebration. But in the midst, after the festivities, after everything was done and over with, the Bible lets us know that they leave to go back home. What you got to understand here, the Bible says that when they left the Jerusalem, Jesus, for some uncertain reason, 
that we may not understand, but he had another call. He stayed behind, the Bible says. And I thought about the significance of this. It's because sometimes this is what we do as people. Sometimes when we get in a place or situation where we have enjoyed the feast and the celebration of God, sometimes we can forget our circumstances, our surroundings, and those that may have been with us. Have you ever been someplace where you forgot about your own children? You were in the mall shopping. You got your bags. You were so happy, sisters, because you got that dress that was on sale. You were so happy because you saw them Louis Vuittons or whatever they call them shoes. You saw the price was $895, but today, your day, they were on sale for $175. You forgot about Bubba, Leroy, Skillet, Shamika, Tanika, and you grabbed them shoes and, you, and got your bag. You're going out the store, you're happy, but you forgot your children. I had this happen to me last Sunday. I was in the mall. We were waiting to get in after church last Sunday at the Cheesecake Factory. I had Biggs, Monty, and Little Dimples with us. We were walking around. Angela decided to stay and wait, but we went walking around. We get to the mall. We had the escalator going down. I wanted to walk around, but Biggs and Monty and them wanted to get on the escalator. You know, kids, they want to have some fun and play. We get on there as we're on the escalator going from the second floor just to the first. The door opens. I turn. Monty's here. Dimples is here. I fix something on Monty. But Biggs, being like Jesus, instead of staying behind Biggs, gets out the elevator. I turn to look for Biggs, and the door is closing. I said, where's Biggs? And Dimples says, he got off. In my mind, in my heart, it was racing. We had to go back upstairs. I'm going upstairs. I'm thinking, I said, Lord, you got a blessing. Lord, protect him. I'm thinking about my grandson. I said, he's going to be frantic. He's going to be running around screaming. Where's my grandpa? Grandpa, where you at? Grandpa, you left me. Well, we get, down, we get back downstairs. The door opens. Who's standing at the door? It's Biggs. He wasn't frantic. He wasn't upset. He said, Grandpa, y'all left me. But I wasn't scared. I just waited right here. He said, Grandpa, these nice people. They waited with me. I told them they could leave, but they waited right here with me. And I thought about this text here. Sometimes we get so caught up in where we're at and what we're doing, we forget about those sometimes that are with us. Here, Mary and Joseph and the family and everybody was there. They done celebrated. They done had a great time. They were enjoying themselves, but now they're going back. But Jesus, being that inquisitive one, like many of us sometimes, when we don't get what we want or sometimes when we want to see something. You know how it is. You can be somewhere and you stray away. Jesus strayed away from everybody else because he had another assignment that he had to fulfill. But here, the Bible lets us know now a day's journey away. They finally come to the encampment place. What you got to understand is when the caravan left the festivities, when they left the Passover, the women and children left first because of the fact that they were slow moving because the women had the children and other things. Some of you women right now, you ought to give God a praise that you're a part of Western civilization and not Middle Eastern civilization. Because here in Western civilization, we value our women a little bit more than the Eastern civilization and the Middle Eastern civilization. We as men help more. Their men don't help at all. It's the women's responsibility to maintain, take care of the children. The men provide. Here, the responsibility was upon Mary and those women that were there. When they got to the place of encampment, the men had caught up with them. That's when they realized and recognized, think about this, a full day had passed. Jesus had been gone a full day. Everybody was celebrating, laughing, joking, giggling. The kids were having fun. Jesus is back in Jerusalem. It's when Joseph and them, the men rise up and come up, they begin to look for Jesus. I begin to think about this. I said to myself, I wonder if Mary and Joseph had a little heated fellowship. Y'all know what heated fellowship is, don't you? I wonder, did Joseph look at him and say, woman, what's your problem? You were supposed to be looking out after Jesus and the other kids and those with you. You're so caught up talking to Sue, Sally, Mary, and them that you forgot about Jesus. And I thought about what Mary's response was. She probably got some crook in that neck. Through that weave back. See, everybody wears weave. Weave ain't just a black thing. It's a woman thing. 
Every woman you know, I don't care what color, nationality, they done had some or will have some weave in their hair. But I bet you Mary snapped that weave back and said, look at here. Who you think you talking to? Mama didn't raise no fools. Who you talking to? You were supposed to. The heat of fellowship took place. In the midst of it all, it still didn't help because Jesus was still back in Jerusalem. So the Bible says that now all of a sudden, after a long day's journey, ready to go home, close to home, now they got to turn around, pack up everybody, and they go back. The Bible says it was a three days. After three days, they found him. But what you got to realize, it was one day they'd already spent getting to where they had camped, another day to go back to the Jerusalem, and then while they were there, it was another day. In the midst of it, they come back and find Jesus. But where did they find him? They found him in the temple. But what it is sometimes is we lose sight of that thing we think is most precious to us. It shows you something about his parents and even the family members, the cousins, the uncles, the aunts, the relatives. Everybody was so caught up in everything around them and pertaining to them, they weren't thinking about the boy named Jesus. This is where some of us are right now. We're so caught up in everything else around us, we have lost sight of who we really should be worshiping and praising right now. We're so caught up right now in this pandemic that's going on. Some of you all can't sleep at night. You're walking the floors. You're panicking. Your mind is racing. But this is a time where you shall lock in and focus on Jesus like never before. Because he's soon to come. He sent this pandemic to wake up the church of the living God to allow us to see that our lives wasn't right where they should be. We ought to be in the place and position. How many of you have been praying more than you ever prayed before? He had to send a pandemic to get you to pray. How many of you are reading your Bible like you never read it before? He had to send a pandemic to get you to pray. How many of you all? A fasting like you never fast before. He had to send a pandemic to get you to focus on spiritual things, to build you, to grow you. But let me give you something here that you probably never thought about. Some of you right now, you're mad, you're upset. You want to throw in the towel. But let me let you know, the closest, when things get the most heated, contemptuous, when things get to a place and position where you just want to throw in the towel, that's when you ought to step back, buckle up your knee strap, your shoes, and anchor in like never before because you just moments away from a great blessing. But what the enemy wants to do is get you focused on everything else that's surrounding you and around you, but not get your eyes on Jesus. So he brings distractions. He's a master of distraction. And what happens is we get caught up in the distraction instead of keeping our eyes focused on Jesus. During this time and moment where we're at, this is not a time to lose sight nor lose focus on who Jesus really is. This is a time where you got to lock in, you got to buckle up, and you got to wipe your teary eyes. You got to have your cries, dry your nose, but you got to say, devil, whatever you throw at me, I'm not going to move. You can throw the kitchen sink. My husband can leave me. My wife can leave me. My kids can act up, but I'm going to stay anchored in Jesus because I know my blessing is on the way. But see, some of us get like, Mary, Mar Mary, Joseph, the relatives. We get so caught up in the celebration of God, but we forget and realize about him himself. Thank you, Tom. We get caught up in everything else around us. It's not important about what you look like. See, I love this pandemic. I'm going to get myself in trouble right now. I love this pandemic. Why you say that, preacher? Because the pandemic made us focus not on coming to God's house, church, or any church dressed to the nines. See, some of y'all got so caught up in the nice dresses, the suits, the bow ties, and the ties that you couldn't really give God no worship. Because you was afraid to get them Gucci shoes you had on messed up. You was afraid to get them Hickory Freeman and them alligator shoes dented up or scratched up. You was afraid to get a crinkle or a wrinkle in that Zanetti suit that you had on. You was afraid to get that dress that you paid $675 for, but nobody know you got it in the next to new shop. Let me be, oh, I didn't mean to say that. 
But you want to come in here flaunting. You want to come in here carrying your purse. You want to come in here pimping in your suit and your shoes. You forgot all about what was going on. So you lost, we lost sight of really who God was because we was coming to let people see us and not let us see him. So what did he do? He sent something into the land that caused his people to now begin to cry out. What you thought was important, what you thought was significant, now you realize it doesn't mean nothing. Because the only thing that matters is my relationship and my fellowship with the master. But see, we lost sight of who Jesus really is. We lost sight of my purpose and my intent as to be a believer. Some of you right now, you're probably witnessing more than you ever witnessed before. Because now you realize and recognize, I don't want nobody to go to hell, especially myself. And some of you are witnessing more to yourself than you ever witnessed before. See, sometimes we got to get greedy. Y'all always talk about people that talk about to themselves. I talk to myself, and sometimes I answer myself. You can say I'm crazy. You can say I'm insane, but that's all right. I know I'm okay. Because sometimes the Bible tells me you got to encourage yourself in the Lord. During this pandemic, I had to encourage myself. I couldn't wait on nobody else. See, this is an individual salvation, an individual walk. I'm glad and I'm grateful for every one of you that pu pushes me, that prays for me. But when do I begin to do this for myself? And this is what the pandemic is teaching us, that you got to begin to develop your relationship with Jesus Christ. This is where you can't lose sight. Let the one to your left, let the one to your right. If they don't want to go, you go on by yourself. The Bible lets us know there's going to be two in the household, two in the field. Somebody's going to be left behind. Which one is it going to be? Everybody wants their spouse, their companion, their kid to go with them. But you can't make that determination on your own. They have to do it for themselves. Jesus here. They lost sight of him. So here they are going back. And I thought in my mind, Joseph probably was steaming hot. Now I got to go back here. I'm going to lose another day. So I done already took off my vacation. My boss was on my back going back. Mary's probably complaining, now I got to go home. All the kids, you know how y'all women do, all y'all think about it, I got to go home. Now I got to worry about all this extra work I got to do because we went back another day. I had things I had to do. I had my schedule already lined up. You know how y'all women, men don't care about stuff like that. Y'all worried about what y'all got to do. Men was like, man, I, I lost, we worried about money. I done lost a day's work. My money's messed up. Even though he was a carpenter, he probably had jobs lined up waiting for him. But Jesus, the most important thing in that family, the child, the son of God. Think about here now. This shows you something about the mindset of people. They knew that Jesus was a gift straight from heaven. They knew that the, the immaculate conception had nothing to do with them, but God favored them, honored them, blessed them to be the parents, the earthly ones, to impart natural things as well as spiritual into Jesus, giving them an example to show to us what we're supposed to do. But you see something about how they respected what God gave them that they didn't even think about when they left the feast of the Passover, where was Jesus? It shows you no matter what place or position you are, we all going to forget about him at some point in time. And I know some of y'all so super spiritual and saved, y'all want to act like that y'all never forgotten about Jesus. Some of y'all want to sit here and act like y'all never gotten out of line. We've all had some moments, some times, and things we've done that wasn't always spiritual. We've all had what I call some Peter moments. And I bet you Mary and Joseph, I wonder in my mind, if they were like you and I, when they had some heated fellowship, I bet you there were some words that came out of both of their mouths that wasn't always holy. Because all of us have had some heated fellowship moments. I don't care what title, what position you are. If you are not in the place and position where you have fully worked on yourself, there comes a time and a moment you're going to say something or do something that may not, that's not spiritual in the time frame. Because sometimes God will allow you to have a Peter moment to let you know. Because some of us walk around here self-righteous. We walk around here like we're holier than that. We act like our stuff don't stink, like we ain't never done nothing. 
But so what God do? He can say, I'm going to knock you down to your knees. I'm going to put you in a position where you're going to have a Peter moment. It does not lessen the anointing, the power upon your life. But what it does is God showing you what you still got to work on. But see, we can't say that up in the household of faith. Because some of y'all want to act like y'all got it all together. But we all jacked up and messed up. From the floor up, we tore up. But if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, we wouldn't be where we are right now. But they probably had a little heated fellowship. They may have said some things, but it didn't lessen who they were. But you think about it here. It lets us see something The people of people. They forgot about Jesus. Now, they should have been, we thought, think about it. They probably should have been the ones that you think about it in your mind that should have been so concerned about Jesus that when he got a scratch, they should have been right there. But it lets you see the significance of what we place in our lives sometimes and how God, the significance of the things that we should be focused on, we allow the outside exterior things get our focus off Jesus. They find Jesus. He's about his father's business. He's in the tabernacle, the temple, doing the Passover. This was a time where the Sanhedrin court was in session. And during this time, what they were doing, they would answer and have discussions and speak on theological issues and questions that may be there. And here you got a little 12-year-old boy, Jesus. He wasn't worried about mama and daddy, cousin, uncle, aunt being gone. Jesus knew he had another mission. It showed me something in this text I began to think about. Jesus' mind was already made up what he was going to do when they got to the Passover. He had a mission that he had to do. I thought about it. He's 12 years old. Everybody done left him. He's in Jerusalem. He wasn't worried about nothing. He knew his father had him covered and protected. So here he is in the temple. They're asking questions. Jesus is sitting there intently listening and then asking some questions. The Bible lets us see something down here that they were amazed, they were astonished at what Jesus was asking them. A 12-year-old, it showed he wasn't just a natural child, but he had a special calling and anointing upon himself. We see that in children of today. And at young ages, we see that there's something special about that child. That at six, seven, eight years old, you can find them in their living room, mocking and playing in their bedrooms, having church, preaching better than the preacher in the pulpit but because there's something upon their life. But it shows us as parents, that's our role, that's our job, to steer them, to guide them, and lead them in the right direction. Some of y'all think it's cute. Some of y'all think it's, it's funny. But that's God showing you your role, your place, is to prepare this young man, this young girl, for the ministry that God's placing upon their life. But we're we looking everywhere else. But Jesus was about his father's business. Mary and Martha, Mary and Joseph get there. And the Bible lets me see something in verse 48. They saw him, and they were amazed. It let me see something, that even though the Holy Spirit had spoken and ministered to them, pertaining the life of Jesus and what was going to transpire, that they were not fully, 100% persuaded of what he was really going to do. So when they saw him in action, and you know how it is, when you get a word, a prophetic word, about something that's going to pertain to your life, you all doubt it. Y'all don't believe it. Y'all looking for it to come tomorrow, the next hour. But when God gives a word, it has to come from eternity into time and go through the fulfillment of time. That word may not manifest today. It could be six months, six years down the road. But whatever God speaks, it shall and it will come to pass. Your job is not to worry about it. Your job is just to believe it. What I tell folk all the time, you put it in a tape recorder, you write it down, put it up on the shelf. And when it comes to pass, you pull it down and you can say, that word came to pass. If you write it down, if you got it on a tape, listen to that word. Let it get in your spirit. So when it comes into manifestation, you already know that God has spoken. And you can give him praise, honor, and glory because what he said he was going to do, he has done. And what he's done is he's increased your faith so that when he speaks again, you won't doubt. You will believe, you will trust what he sent through his manservant to speak to your life. Hear Jesus. Is there, he got his mother, they're amazed at what has transpired. This child of theirs that they looked at as a natural child, like I do Biggs, like I do Monty, like I do Dimples, like I do other kids, but we don't see sometimes the significance of what God is birthing in them that we need to nurture. They didn't understand it. And I like Jesus' response in verse number 49. 
He looks up at his mother and father. And can I put it in natural vernacular? He looked at them and said, what's your problem? What are y'all all upset and worried about? I was just hanging out and doing what my father told me to do. I was, what we say, I was handling business. Jesus, at 12 years of age, was teaching us something. That in times, we got to handle business. During this time and season that we're in, it's not time to worry about a new house, a new car, a new home, a new job, so to speak. It's time to worry about doing my father's business. This is the time where we got to lock in and focus on what's really important. Nothing wrong with a new house. Nothing wrong with a new car. Nothing wrong with new clothes. Nothing wrong with a new job. Nothing wrong with traveling. But in the midst of all that, don't lose sight of who Jesus really is. What is Jesus calling you to do? This is the time to focus in on Jesus and not everybody else. If you got to cut folk loose, he teaches me something in here. Sometime to do my father's business, i got to let folk go. But see, some, what's our problem? We want to bring everybody from the hood with us. Sometimes God wants to take you to another dimension, but you want to bring them same hood rats that he's trying to separate you from. You can't bring them with you. Sometimes even people in the church that you've been brought with, up with, you may have came into the church with them, filled with the Spirit at the same time, but you got to let them go. When you begin to think about the relationships God has for us, You got the multitudes, you got the 12, and you got the three. But at some point, you got to get get away from those who are not going in the vein that you're going. The three is the prime example of these are the ones that are locked in to your vision, your purpose, and your destiny. They're the ones that help pursue you and push you there. The 12 was just a group you hung out with to get you ready because in the 12, you had that one devil that catch you on your knees. See, sometimes y'all don't understand, y'all don't realize the people in your life are not going to be there for the nothing but a season. And they're there for a reason. But well, what is it about human nature that we think everybody with us is going to go everywhere we go? No. That's the problem why some of you can't advance in the kingdom because God's trying to grow you. So he's bringing you to a place and position of growth. And growth causes pain. It causes hurt. It causes travail and turmoil. Why? Because nobody wants to be stretched. Nobody wants to be pulled and tugged on. But if you want to grow and go higher in God, you got to go through the fire because he's got to refine you to prove you. And to purify you for the gifts and callings that he has placed upon and within you. But we don't want to go there. Because it's painful. It's lonely. But Jesus lets me see that I could care less about anybody else. When I've been given a divine assignment, my place and my position is to do my father's business. And Jesus here lets everybody see. And teaching us today. We can't lose sight of my father's business. We can't lose sight of who Jesus is. Church of the living God, those here in the pews today and viewing, don't lose sight of who Jesus is. Don't get caught up in everything around you. How come we have an issue and a problem? I've been teaching on, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. When you begin to think about the shepherd and what, His role in your life is a shepherd is there to guide you, provide for you, and to lead you. You don't have to want for nothing because Jesus is our shepherd, the ultimate shepherd. I shall not want. What does that mean? Whatever I need, my shepherd, Jehovah Jireh, is going to provide. Whatever I'm dealing with, my shepherd. Jehovah Jireh is going to provide the relief, provide the increase. Whatever I need, I ain't got to worry about nothing. But what happens is we get so caught up in everything around us and not focused on Jesus. When you know who Jesus is, why are you worried? Why are you complaining? I hear God telling me right now to tell some of you under the sound of my voice in this viewing, From this moment on, don't you worry, don't you fret, nor don't you cry because your father who sits high and looks low has got you covered. 
You don't have to worry no more. Don't you pace the floors at midnight no longer. Don't you worry about a bill that's coming in your household. If God, I got a saying that he taught me. God never takes you nowhere you haven't already been. Some of you all have forgotten where God has brought you from because you lost sight of Jesus. Some of you have been struggling before you're struggling right now, but he brought you through. Some of you have already missed some meals in years past. But see, you got so complacent, you got so on yourself being able to provide, you got so to the place where you forgot that you would, there was a time when you couldn't eat filet mignon, lamb chops, porterhouse steaks. You were eating ramen noodles. You were eating bologna and cheese. I had a flashback before I closed. When I got my first job out of college in um, 1989, that's just a few days ago, ain't it? Just a few days ago. I got my first job. I left Muncie, Indiana, going down to Indianapolis, Indiana. I had me a 1983 Renault, two-door. It was a green color. I had a sunroof. It was pop-up. I had leather seats. I had heavy D on the back, playing the overweight lovers in the house on the CD with the, the, the tape. No air conditioner. And I'm so happy that I have my job. I get down to Indianapolis. I had $25 in my pocket. My first week, I get, I was, my uncle said, nephew, since you just started, you can live with me. He charged me a little amount of rent. And I was like, okay, um, first day off the work, I went to work. We go to lunch. You know how God provides for his people. My boys, come on, D-man, we're going to lunch. Where are we going? We went to this restaurant called Ryan's. It was an all-you-can-eat buffet. Back then, at 260 pounds, you know, all you can eat was right up my alley. So we go there, and we eat for about an hour, hour and a half, go back to the office. Didn't have to pay for nothing. That night, after I got off work at 5 o'clock, I get home about 5.30. I'm in my uncle's house. I walk in. And I smelled something smelling good. At that time, I was still eating pork, eating steaks, beef, and all that. I smelled a steak cooking. It was smelling good. The house was smelling good with the steak. He had a big old pot of green beans with potatoes in them. He had some, um, so he had fixed some corn. And then he had a big pot of cornbread. He said, I said, oh, Unc, you got it smelling nice up in here. Yeah, nephew, you know, I know how to cook a little bit. I said, yeah, uncle. I said, what time we eating? He took a step back and looked at me. He said, I'm eating about 15 minutes. You going to eat what you bring in this house. $25 in my pocket. Wasn't going to get paid until that Friday because they got paid every week. And my, my boss said, you know, I'm going to take care of you this week as well. I went to the grocery store. This is no story. I go into the store, $25 in my pocket. Tears kind of begin to well up in my eyes. It's different from mom and dad's house. You know, I could open up the refrigerator, mom and dad's house. It was everything that you wanted right there. And you know how you are, when you're in mom and dad's house, grandpa's in them house, mama's house, you got the nerve sometimes to fuss and complain because what you want ain't in there. But when you got to go buy it for yourself, it's a whole different ball game. Here I am in Marsh Grocery Store in Indianapolis, Indiana. I'll never forget it. I go. I get a loaf of bread. At that time, it was white bread that we eat. We wasn't sophisticated enough to be eating wheat bread. I got a pack of Jimmy Dean sausage in the roll. I got some potato chips that just said, Potato chips. It was a white bag with black letters and said potato chips. And I got some generic soda that when I got home, it was flat. That was my meal for the week. Flash forward now, the year 2020. I look back 
if God put me in that position again, it wouldn't be a big issue because I've already been there before. I'm telling somebody right now, why are you worried about it? You've already been there before. If he brung you out of it one time, he's going to bring you by through again. So stop worrying. Stop complaining. All you got to do is stay focused on who Jesus is. Church, let's get our eyes back on Jesus. Let's not focus on everything around us. Let's not focus all on the material thing. But the only thing that matters is where is my relationship with the Father? The only thing that matters is, is my life pleasing in his sight? The only thing that matters is if I'm giving him true worship, praise, honor, and glory. Let's bow our heads. Father, in the name of Jesus right now, I pray today that something's been said to bless your people, to help us go to another dimension in thee. During this pandemic situation, Father, we're not going to be concerned about it. We know, God, you've brought us through situations far worse than these at times, in our minds, in our hearts, in our spirits. So, God, because you said you never leave us nor forsake us, during this pandemic, we're standing on that word that you're never going to leave us nor forsake us, that you're going to bring us through. You're going to be there with us. You're going to guide us, shield us, and protect us. And, Father, I pray for those right now that are wayward in their minds. Bring them back in full circle, oh God. Help them, oh God, to see that you're right there with them. You're trying to mature them. You're trying to grow us. But most importantly, Lord, you want us to go and excel, to be about your business, which is kingdom winning, which is soul winning, which is being an example in the body of Christ to be a blessing to other people. Now, Father, I thank you for those that are here and those that are viewing this morning. As we're here today, you speak and you minister what needs to be spoken and done. And we thank you. We give you honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. For those of you viewing and those of you here right now, if you don't have him as Savior and Lord of your life, you can have it today. You can't, you know, I know because of social distancing, you may not be able to walk down these aisles and we can't lay hands on you. But you can stand right where you are. You can even sit right where you are. And you can lift your hands and you can cry out to him. Just as they did on the day of Pentecost. There was no one there laying hands on them. There was no one there smacking them upside their heads. Come about hallelujah, hallelujah. They were there in one accord, one spirit, tuned in. And the power of the Holy Ghost fell upon them when their heart and their spirit met the requirements that he was looking for. The power smacked them. In the name of, you can have that right now. You can have it viewing in your home, but it's up to you. It's up to you. It's up to you. But whatever you get out of this message, don't lose sight of Jesus. Let's give God some hand praise in here this morning. <laughs> Truly, we want to thank everyone that's, that's viewed and come today. We want you to know that God loves you. He's here for you. He'll never leave you, but we leave him. He never turns his back on us. We turn our back on him. But the key thing is we got to stay focused on Jesus, not the distractions that are going up around. All the things that we're worried about, the political contest that's coming up upon the elections on November 3rd. That's significant but is insignificant to a believer because no matter who wins, they're not in control. Jesus is in control. So I don't worry about what man gets in the White House because my house is greater. And I know that whoever God, because of what you got to realize and understand, every president that's elected, every foreign leader that's elected, their only purpose and plan is to fulfill his plan, which is to move us closer to his soon coming. And we're right there. We're on the cusp of Jesus coming. So don't get locked in on all this, but you get locked in on your relationship with him. Now, this morning, I want you that are viewing with us. We're getting ready to sow. We're getting ready to give. Go to the website there in the upper right-hand corner while you're there, and you can give this morning. PayPal, GiveLify, Cash App. Our Cash App is dollar sign God's House Church. For those of you who do not like to use the modium, the meads, of technology, you can write in to God's House Church, 2335 Wyoming Boulevard, Northeast, Albuquerque, New Mexico, 87112. Mail it in every week, Wednesday, 
Sundays and throughout the week because some people are giving every day of the week. People all across the country and the world are giving. I lay my hands on my computer screen for everybody that's giving and those that come in the mail. I pray blessings in favor of God. I had a brother come to my office yesterday and begin to testify the goodness of God, how he was in debt, but he began to sow like never before. God has erased the debt that he was in, all because he took a leap and a step of faith and trust in the midst of a pandemic situation. Some of you in here, God has blessed you. I got a brother, he's not here today, just got a brand new Mercedes Benz in the midst of a pandemic. But because he's a giver and a sower, God has blessed. God's still blessing his people. If you do what the word says, God will fulfill his word in your life. So sow this morning. Give not grudgingly, but give willfully and cheerfully so that God can bless you. God doesn't want you to give with stinginess. Keep it. It's no benefit to him or yourself. But when you come, you ought to give like never. How many of y'all have truly tried God in your giving? How many of you have truly said, okay, Lord, I'm going to try you? You can't just do it one week or two weeks. You got to be consistent about it. Just like when you're working out. You can't work out and say, okay, I got a goal. I'm going to lose 15 pounds. But you think you're going to do it in a 30-minute session. You got to give it three months, maybe four months. But when you begin to see the manifestation of your work, that you put in, you begin to want to do even more. Some of you that know what I'm talking about, and you're giving. When you begin to give, the more you give, you begin to see him give more. And what happens is we get competitive with God. But we know we can't be God-giving no matter how hard we try. But as you give, as you sow, watch him bless your life, not only from a natural standpoint, but in other realms and areas of your life. You'll see God do tremendous and awesome things. But we want you to sow. We want you to give. Those of you viewing, tune in with us on Tuesday at 12 noon. Will there be a word out of the mouth of our assistant pastor, Pastor Vester Smith? Tune in on Wednesday. Lord willing, I'll be back with you picking up our series, Crisis in the Mist, uh, Confidence in the Mist of a Crisis. We're going to pick that back up. Dealing with Psalms number 23. There's some powerful stuff that God has in there. I hope to pray to God that I'll be able to minister that. And then next Sunday, we'll be back with you again. I believe the man of God, the bishop, should be back. And if not, God's vessel will be up here to speak, to declare, and decree your words. But we just want to thank you all for tuning in with us here at God's House Church. The place where everybody's somebody and nobody's a stranger. Those of you here, can we rest upon our feet this morning? As we begin to pray the prayer of faith, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray today, God, that you would bless those as they give their offerings, their tithes today. Let the word that you declared in Malachi become relevant and prevalent in the lives of these, your people. As they begin to sow, I praise you, God, for opening up the windows of heaven and pouring out a blessing that they cannot, shall not have room enough to receive. I pray, God, that you would do exceedingly abundantly, above all they were thinking, even asking, the gift that they have placed upon in their hands, the seed, and they have written on it what they're requiring from thee, that they're looking for you to do. Father, you do that and much, much more. And Father, we give you praise, we give you honor, and we give you glory. As they sow right now, we praise you for the harvest coming into the house so that we can do the upkeep of thy kingdom. Father, be with us and bless us. Protect and guide us all as we leave this place, but never thy presence. Keep our minds, our hearts, and our spirits focused in on thee like never before. In the precious and mighty name of Jesus, with uplifted hands, let us all say, Lord, we thank you, and Lord, we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. For those of you on my right and my left, you may exit out your roles, maintain your social distancing. We thank you and bless you. We look for you in this place again next Sunday at 11 a.m. Sharp. Be with us. Come with us to celebrate and magnify the God of our salvation. Dr. Harvey Hale, don't you leave.